Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. And for those of you who've been here for a lot of the talks, thank you so much for taking time out of a really busy time to do really hard, important work. Those of you who've been here all day probably don't need any more content warnings at this point. You know that all the way through the day, all of the talks have been about difficult, painful material that make us vulnerable in lots of different ways. Um, but I just want to repeat that my talk's going to be like that as well. And you need to do whatever you need to do to um, make sure that you can listen to it safely or make sure that you can, you can leave. So if you want to check your phone or leave or whatever, um, you take care of yourself because this stuff is really hard and, um, and it's harder for some people than for others. Um, I am a highly privileged white cis woman. Um, that means a couple of things. Um, it means that I haven't had the lived experience of the trans people that I'll be talking about today, although some of the people whom um, I consider friends and family um, have had that experience and continue to have those experiences. But I also think it's really important that highly privileged feminist scholars like me make sure in our teaching and our scholarship and our activism to extend our focus beyond people who have had our experiences um, to people who suffer much more under the various axes of oppression that you are all too aware of. Um, but uh, there's much, of course, to be learned from feminist scholars who have also, uh, who also live the experience of being a trans person in a transphobic society. I'll be talking about a couple of those scholars today. I urge you to seek out their work. So people like Talia Mae Betcher, people like Julia Serrano are worth reading over and over and over again. Okay, um, you know from what I've been saying and you know from the program that I'm gonna talk about right culture and trans people. Before I get into that, I want to float a different way of conceiving of rape culture. It aligns with the various things we've already heard today, um, but it's not exactly as we've heard it earlier today, I think. First of all, here's what rape culture isn't. Rape culture isn't a culture in which rapes occur. We can at least imagine, and certainly it's been imagined in some speculative fiction, from, from some science fiction, cultures that are utopian in many respects, and yet in which rapes occur, right? They're not um, necessary, they're not rape cultures. What makes our culture a rape culture isn't the fact that rapes occur in it, it's that our culture um, c possesses certain structural features that cause rapes to occur in a particular way. And here are the two structural features I, I, I've been thinking about as I think about this material. Um, a rape culture, I think, normalizes sexual violence by reinforcing the view that some people's bodies are in some sense public property, right? If we say that some people's bodies, in virtue of belonging to a particular demographic, are the kinds of bodies that we get to scrutinize and judge and touch and harm just because they belong to a certain kind of embodiment, then that is a part of the normalizing function of, of rape culture, right? And you see that in really banal ways. We've been hearing all day about some of the mundane ways that rape culture uh, manifests itself. So if you think that you have the right to say that somebody's skirt is too short, um, then for some reason you are living, you seem to be expressing some kind of judgment that uh, that person's body is your business, right? And it's that idea that other people's bodies are somehow available to us that I think normalizes various kinds of sexual violence. But I think the other side of what makes a culture, a rape culture, is the way in which rape and sexual violence is exoticized within that culture. What do I mean by exoticized? Well, I mean, for instance, perpetuating the myth that rape is pre predominantly perpetrated by evil strangers, right? That, that rape occurs in dark corners when some evil person shows up, 
rather than occurring predominantly in the home, right? Predominantly in domestic contexts. The idea that the rapist is some kind of outsider rather than somebody in our own community, right? And that notion of the rapist as outsider, as exotic, inevitably has ableist and cis-sexist and racist and, and so on and so on connotations, right? Think about Trump, not all Mexicans are rapists, right? This is, this is the language of exoticizing the rapist as somebody on the outside, right? And, and we do that both to exonerate ourselves from our sins on the inside, right? And to clearly demarcate who doesn't belong. So it's a way of further marginalizing people. And I think that a culture is a rape culture if it serves that twin function of normalizing sexual violence and exoticizing sexual violence, okay? The really painful, awful thing about the intersection of transphobia, so hatred of, of trans people and gender non-conforming people, the intersection of transphobia with rape culture is it means that trans people get hit by both of those aspects of rape culture. Um, both the normalizing side of it and the exoticizing side of it. I'm going to talk about each of those things in turn, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll come up with a couple of ways that we can try to help. Okay, so normalizing. The normalizing side of trans culture, or sorry, of, of rape culture, and how that harms trans people in particular. Again, I think that the normalizing side of rape culture is to treat certain bodies as, in a sense, public property over which we have some kind of rights. And so um, the way that intersects with, tra it, with transphobia is treating trans bodies as bodies over which non-trans people have some kind of rights. And you see that really palpably in the astonishing, heartbreaking um, statistics around violence against trans people. Look at virtually every statistic around violence and trans people are at the extreme end in terms of their experience of violence. By some accounts, 50% of trans people will be sexually assaulted over the course of their lives. 50-5-0, right? Um, according to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, um, those respondents who express a transgender identity or a non-conforming gender identity while in school reported a uh, harassment rate of 78% and a physical assault rate of 35%. There's other data that shows that trans women are 1.8 times more likely to experience sexual violence when compared to other survivors. And as you are no doubt aware, those statistics become even more terrible when we look at trans people who are racialized as non-white, right? So trans women of color are among the most vulnerable people in our society. So those are kind of the extreme harms that you think about um, when you think about sexual violence. But I think that that normalizing aspect of rape culture um, produces a lot of those other mundane, I don't, I don't think they're mundane, but um, other kinds of harms that don't make their way into the statistics, right? So for instance, um, intentional mispronouning of trans people that implies that you get to decide what their gender is rather than them. Dead naming, a similar phenomenon, refusing to use the name um, that they use. Uh, our constant violation of trans people's medical privacy, right? Every time a trans person goes on a talk show, there are questions about what medical procedures they have undergone. Nobody else gets this line of questioning by the media, but we, for some reason, think it's appropriate with trans people because their bodies are in some sense public. We get to surveil them and scrutinize them in a way that we don't think we get to do with virtually any other bodies in society. Um, another consequence of the normalizing aspect of uh, rape culture for trans people it's the myth of the deceptive trans person. This is a deeply um, dangerous myth, but it's ubiquitous. The idea that a trans person is actually a cis person in disguise, right? And this leads to um, further harms of trans people. Some of the um, uh, 
famous cases of uh, sexual assaults of trans people begin with forced genital examination and then lead to rape as a kind of punishment, right? And it's a punishment for deception. Now this myth, this false, dangerous myth that trans people are deceiving us, I think, um, plays into the second aspect of rape culture, the exoticizing side of it. And we see this in particular in bathroom bills. Anybody know what a bathroom bill is? Everybody knows what a bathroom bill is, right? So bathroom bill, we've seen them now in Arizona, Nevada, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas. They were enacted in North Carolina and Wisconsin seeks to control which bathrooms people get to use based on their genitalia, not based on their gender identity. Why would you do that? Well, we hear over and over the arguments in favor of bathroom bills, this worry that trans people, and in particular trans women, are just men who are deceiving people in order to get into a, a female space in order to perpetrate sexual violence on women. This actually occurs in a history of using this gambit over and over and over. We saw the same kind of argument during the Jim Crow period against integrated bathrooms because there was this worry that letting people of color into the white women's bathroom would expose white women to rape. When in the US they tried to pass the Equal Rights Amendment that was recast by Phyllis Schlafly, may she rest in peace, as the uh, shared bathroom bill, and many historians see that as the reason that uh, the Equal Rights Amendment failed in the US. Um, and it relates to more recent claims by trans-exclusionary radical feminists like uh, Janice Raymond that all trans lesbians effectively, and I apologize for saying this, obviously I don't believe it, effectively rape women by entering their space. There's this whole historical continuum that relies on um, this idea of the deceiving outsider, the exotic outsider, who is going to be some kind of threat to women. And by women, of course, we mean cis white women, right? I don't, you don't, but the people using this kind of language do. Earlier, my colleague, Professor Kenyon, um, talked about the you know, angry father who says, you better not try to harm my daughter. There was a really famous case during all of the debates around bathroom bills in the US um, when Jerry Boykin, who was fired from his professorial position for making the remarks, but then hired a year later by the same institution, um, Boykin remarked, the first man who goes in the restroom with my daughter will not have to worry about surgery. Notice that this shows the intersection of transphobia and rape culture in both of the respects. The worrying about surgery thing is bringing in these private medical matters that some people consider essential to the identity of the trans person and brings along a corollarial threat of violence. But in the very same move, the trans person is exoticized as a threat to real women. Right? Um, So the insidious thing about this intersection is it's the very same mechanism that puts trans people of all genders at a higher risk of violence than any other group, casts them as the real threat. What can we do about this? Well, we can, let, we can lobby for gender neutral washrooms. We need to do a better job of lobbying for gender, ne gender neutral washrooms on this campus. Demand it at every meeting you go to, insist upon it every time you're consulted about space and even when you're not consulted. Shut it down when a friend or a relative shares transphobic or trans misogynistic opinions. Advocate for safer spaces for trans people, both physically and emotionally. Homelessness is rampant among trans people. Advocate for housing for trans people, and they're going to be safer than if they're on the street. Advocate for better data. Stats Canada doesn't properly include trans people in the annual census. We can't help if we don't have data. Write letters to, to Stats Canada. Um, urge your MP to support Bill C-16, which will amend the Human Rights Act to ban discrimination against people based on gender identity. 
Um, mark November 20th, the Trans Day of Remembrance, and support GLOW and the Waterloo Region Rainbow Coalition. GLOW has materials on the end of this table. I urge you to visit them. It's important. Do it today. Thank you very much.